Almost 50 years. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the people he's come in contact with. Uh, not so famous, famous, memorable, not so memorable. Uh, why don't we do it uh, based on uh, timeline, sort of, uh, not sports specific, but uh, back uh, since you graduated from high school and started in your career. Uh, some of the people that stand out in your memory, and let's focus first on Columbia athletes. Okay. Well, it would be interesting, I think, to begin with a gentleman named uh, Moore Landers. Moore was a year or two uh, younger than I was, but Moore was quite the uh, phenom in basketball in Columbia, Tennessee, and his he grew up in the Riverside area where they had a few outdoor courts and later on indoor courts. And, and uh, uh, Moore uh, went after his junior year at Columbia High School where he made All-State. The basketball coach went to Morgan Parish, went on to Florida. And so he saw a chance to go on to, to Columbia Military Academy and played. And Moore played there at Columbia Military Academy. And, had a chance to go on the University of Houston and play. And he he actually broke some Missouri Valley Conference freshman records. They couldn't play varsity. They broke some records that Oscar Robinson had set with the uh, University of Cincinnati. He set some scoring and some uh, uh, shooting percentage records. And one thing I can remember about Moore at CMA one day, they, Bill Wade was his coach there and his postgraduate year. You could play a, a year after your high school year to further your education and further your preparation for college sports. So Moore was was rather lazy at times and so Bill Wade told Moore said, you're going to stay in the ball game, you're going to start, but you, the first time you miss a shot you're going out. It was against a team called St. Andrews which was then coached by Paul Sands, which I didn't know at that time. I didn't know Paul Sands like I will later. Well, Moore had 42 points when he went out of the game. <laughs> so Moore could put it in the basket when he had to stay on the court. And he plays. And Moore went on to be, he played at University of Houston, finished at University of Tennessee Martin, and came back and, and coached at Columbia Military Academy before going into the insurance business very successfully through so many years. But uh, that's one of the first I think about. Another one I think about at that time was how I won Hal Walton was the best all-around athlete of that era, and I think he could match up with a lot of them through, through, through all my years because Hal had the one thing that I always think that an all-around athlete has to have, and he makes everybody on the team better by, by just being the quarterback of the football team or the shortstop or catcher on baseball or the guard on the basketball team. Hal wasn't necessarily the best at any one thing, but he could do all the things that was needed. He was, he was strong, he had enough speed, and he, he had leadership qualities. And of course, Hal passed away this past year in Knoxville. He went on to the University of Tennessee. Actually, uh, was the first person to take a snap as quarterback for the University of Tennessee when they switched from the single wing to that, though he actually played the rocking back position in their single wing offense. So he, he was good enough that when he left his quarterback under Jim Cartwright at Columbia Central to be a, a starter for the University of Tennessee when his first year that he was eligible as a sophomore year. And Howe was, could have been a first round pick as a catcher in the Major League Baseball draft switch hitter. But how, uh had played shortstop, and of course football was was his heart and soul. There's been several since in in all the sports. Uh, I guess to stay on the trend of Riverside and basketball. Uh, Lee Fowler came along in the uh, through the my years right through the 60s. Lee was uh, helped lead his junior year, lead Columbia to the. State tournament under Coach Hardy Lloyd. Hardy uh, came in and stepped in to be a basketball coach there. Coach Cartwright was was the all all sport head coach there for so many years, and 
and uh, Hardy stepped in there and did an excellent job with basketball, and Lee was the first player to step up, and of course he went on. I can remember the days he'd been recruited by North Carolina, by Auburn, uh, Texas, wound up going to uh, Vanderbilt, and they unretired Clyde Lee's number 43 jersey for Lee to wear at Vanderbilt. That was the drawing card, and uh, Lee went on after his Vanderbilt years, including the SEC championship season with with uh, Van Breda, Jan Van Bredekoff, Terry Compton, Bill Ligon, those guys. He, he went on to uh, coach some University of Memphis as assistant coach, and then is now the athletic director of North Carolina State. And uh, been quite prominent in the NCAA. He was head of the NCAA basketball selection committee a few years ago. And, now that's some of the uh, early ones. I'm sure there's been several more. Regent Peebles. Well, Regent Peebles. He played in the High Walton era. The, the whole story there with Regent is and is that uh, he would have been playing if he'd stayed his four years at Alabama. Might have been the player that would have kept Joe Namath from being such a great passer because he would have had to hand the ball off to him, to, to Regent more because he was such a good, strong runner. But my story with him would correlate with one of my coaching heroes later on when, when uh, I think i just bring this out right now. Uh, Bear Bryant was recruiting Regent, but he hadn't gone to see Regent. Gene Stallings was assistant coach for Alabama. Gene had visited. So uh, the word was that, that uh, Bear was going to have to make an appearance there to pay his household on West 7th Street to to uh, lure him in. Well, and that was part of it. Barry had to show up and do that. But part of the deal was the region was going to go, the quarterback was going to have to go too. So uh, Jerry Hines was quarterback, and uh, uh, Jerry, uh, so Jerry went along, and he, he was the backup quarterback there for Joe Namath for a while. But, uh, uh, Region encountered some problems there at Alabama, but uh, went on later on to be an attorney uh, and finished his school in the University of the South, but he had a little difficulty early. But Region was a dynamic six foot two, 195 pound running back, which you don't have many of in that era. You may have some that you have now, but you didn't have them back then. He had the speed and size. And of course, he played baseball and basketball, and basketball was just the conditioning period between seasons for him. But he was part of a, of a uh, the first Babe Ruth State Championship team that Columbia had back, uh, they won a tournament in Clarksville. I can almost tell you who was playing what positions. That region was center fielder. Uh, Jim, a Dooley guy played left field. Bob Seagraves played center field. Pete Henry played first base. Charlie Poe, Roy Vick played second base. Hal Wallen played shortstop. And Dale Gephardt, Bill Lynch for catchers. Dilly Craig played third base. Mm -hmm. Wayne Roberts played first base, played right field, pitched some. That was, that's just kind of ran right to me right then. Great. Uh, <laughs> okay, keep on going. I know from my coaching days, we, we faced people like Vance Ballou, John Painter. Uh, some of the people that that were in the in the seventies, eighties. Well, there there was uh, doing Coach Cartwright's career. Coach Cartwright had a pretty good handle on what level of play play a player could play, and and he, uh, David Murphy, Frank Howell were two more players, football players, went to the University of Tennessee from the Columbia Lions program right a few years after Howell Walton. But the, probably the biggest. Name through there, the player that the opponents of Columbia remember the most was James Woody. Yeah. Well, James Woody would attack him from the linebacker spot, and I can I can tell a guy named James Claiborne who played running back uh, at Shovel, who's been a coach off and on there at Shovel. Which remembers the time he says they're playing at Shovel, and he remembers James Woody hitting him, and him lined up in about the third row of the bleachers when he landed. <laughs> So uh, Woody went on to to high caliber years at the University of Tennessee as a, as a uh, linebacker, and 
was when it was football was his his sport. And then we going, going, going back a little bit, Richard LeMay. Yeah, I just can't forget Richard. Richard, uh, Richard was a good offensive tackle, good good defensive player. He had size. He he made he he his opportunities weren't in in life weren't strong at the time. But with football, he got away into Vanderbilt University, and of course, he did maybe did a little place kicking at Central. But he went on to be a place kicker at at Vanderbilt and a, and in, played in the line. And if I remember correctly, he was a high, very high draft choice. Washington Redskins got a lucrative contract. And I guess if you go back through it all, though we've had several players go into pro football, he probably got the highest pick, highest uh, price, highest paycheck to begin with mm -hmm. in the pro world. Now it's been an insurance business in Knoxville for a number of years. Uh, so back to the 70s, 80s, 90s era. Well, uh, there's two SEC players that come right off the bat in my mind. In the 70s, uh, Manuel Young that I mentioned for his long putt. Manuel was one that, that Coach Cartwright recommended pretty highly to Johnny Majors to take at UT, but uh, he didn't take him. He went on, had a good, good strong career, made all SEC, and was captain of the Vanderbilt football team his, his final year in 81. And, He's been in the insurance business in Columbia since then and been real extremely active in youth sports and football, basketball, all of them. Uh, then uh, John Pointer, played, uh, another one that went to Vanderbilt, played linebacker. Little story on John. He could play as a freshman in his days. and This is bringing back Bear Bryant, but uh, when John was a freshman and he got on the field, and they were getting beat real bad. And, and of course, everybody wanted to get the game over with. Jobs was never say die guy. They were down about eight touchdowns. And, and, and he's, Alabama's got the football driving again, trying to, Bears trying to run the clock off. He called timeout, trying to get Vanderbilt the ball back. <laughs> but John, John was, uh, uh, was is quite, is quite an industrious person. I've done a lot of things with John over the last few years few years, but John's career went on with the uh, uh, Cincinnati Bengals, Green Bay Packers. He was on a uh, Canadian Football League championship team with uh, Warren Moon. Uh, John, John uh, is, let's say, been very industrious in some things. He's now uh, is head of the uh, Alumni Association for Middle Tennessee State. Now, how a Vanderbilt graduate manages that, I don't know. But John Wheeler Dealer, and uh, let's say he's been uh, quite active in, in, in growing the uh, community base for MTSU. All right. Now, as you follow these athletes, you run, also run into the very, very famous names in coaching. I remember my my dad used to say when Marion Wilhoyd called Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant stopped whatever he was doing and went to the phone and talked to Marion. You know, was that <laughs> was that true? Uh, who are some of the coaches you've mentioned, Gene Stallings? And well, there's been you know I've been fortunate to be be in position where it's not myself. It's just the fact that maybe there's an athlete in Columbia that people are recruiting, and that has something to do with the connections and and also being in years. Being able to be with groups of SEC sports writers and broadcasters and their ventures and be around them and meet the coaches. Uh, uh, Roy Skinner at Vanderbilt Basketball, that ha kind of started with uh, uh, in recruiting Lee Fowler, but as I mentioned, my older brother Courtney going to Vanderbilt, my first taste of Vanderbilt Basketball, uh, Courtney got me into a SEC play championship regular season playoff game between LSU and Kentucky. And that's when LSU had uh, Bob Pettit who came along to be a great NBA star and and Kentucky had uh, Cliff Hagen, Frank Ramsey, Lucy Rafflers, of course Adolph Rupp and uh, was a coach and so I got in there with Coach Skinner and because he was his my brother was associated with the Vanderbilt team and so I got to meet Roy Skinner, and I helped him in the 
when he was recruiting Lee Fowler. And, and then the Bear Bryant era, uh, I was on the sidelines when Vanderbilt actually beat a, a Bear Bryant team. Uh, Scott Hunter was the uh, Alabama quarterback. Watson Brown was quarterback at Vanderbilt. Doug Matthews, pretty active in the radio broadcast. Now Doug was tailback. Story behind that is uh, I had a couple of my comrades at the ball game. I was in the press box. They were on the sidelines. Jim Huckabee and Charles Troop. When the game was over, we go into the dressing room, and uh, on the way back home from the ball game, uh, they had a couple of jerseys with them. One of them was number was the Watson Browns. The other one was Doug Matthews. Mm -hmm. I wonder how in the world did they come out with those jerseys from the dressing room? But they had their ways, you know. But uh, so so that's when they was actually recruiting Lee Fowler. Here comes Vanderbilt in the Central High Gym to watch Lee Fowler play basketball, and those two guys are wearing Doug Matthews and Watson Brown's jersey that night. <laughs> I don't know how those things happen. That's that's part of those stories that we go, and that was the Bear Bryant defeat. But the Bear Bryant part, that was the time when when their sports information guy did call and said that Mr. Coach Bryant wanted to speak to you a little bit about the uh, People's Boy. So that's okay. what that's that's how that goes back to it there. That's because I'm the sports editor and I follow his games. And uh, the, the Stalins bit, I didn't have met Stalins in, but SEC Media Days, Gene Stalins' first year as head coach at Alabama, it was 1991, in a Winfrey Hotel in Birmingham. And uh, my uh, photographer at that time was uh, Houston Crozier, and he was at, he, he was just following the trend of the other photographers and said, there's a gentleman out here who wants to speak to you. He said, uh, uh, he said, I said, well, who is it? He said, he said well, there's a whole lot of people trying to make his picture when he went in, so it's somebody important he wants to speak to you. I don't know who he is. I said, well, we can't do that. He's got his own schedule to meet. They come on out here, he's waiting on you. So I go out there and it's Gene Stallings. I never met him. Of course, here's a guy that's been in the, in the pro football world, the collegiate world, and what am I going to do? I walk out there, and I guess maybe he saw my name plate on there, Marion Wilhoit, Daily Herald. And he says, uh, "Hey, I said I'm Marion Wilhoit, Daily Herald," and he said, "I know who you are. You're, you're, you're from the Dimple of the Universe, Mule Town." I said, oh, "Man, I said, Coach Dalton, this just blows my mind." He says, "Uh." uh 1961, Raging Peebles. I said, well, that's right. I said, West 7th Street, right straight away from the courthouse. I said, I said I'm just lost for words. Yeah. And then he says, little pro, he says, and you go out on past the Peebles house, out past the railroad tracks, that's where the military academy is. I said, that's, that's right, coach. He says, Will Hoyt? That's right. He says, you Colonel Willie's son? I said, right. I said, I said, what's, <laughs> how'd that come about? He said, well, he says, you know, I was, I was recruiting CMA players too, and I had to go see your, see your dad to check that, those grades and check, check the, about their behavior. He said, <laughs> you know, that's how that story goes. What a memory what, for what, both of you. Yeah, that's just great. There's another sport that has its roots in the South, auto racing. And there was for a time a Duck River Speedway down by the river, uh, long ago replaced by a shopping center uh, right off the riverside area there. Uh, what are your memories there of some of the early drivers and then moving on into NASCAR with the uh, Cuckoo and Sterling Marling relationship there in Columbia? Well, that's... Uh... It goes back to, there again, my recreation days and then the early days at the Herald. And, and uh, you know, I, I, my take on, on racing was that old, like it was dirt track racing. And uh, there was drivers like uh, Cheryl Harris and Malcolm Brady, uh, Charles Stoffel. They, they all raced around there and they would go to all the dirt tracks. But, you know, it was a, it was, it was quite an experience for people, you know, it's something 
that was was unique to a lot of people and 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 to see that it would certainly draw crowds and like you said you hear the cars going the dirt flying and uh that you know there's a lot a lot of the history there that still goes on like I say in the in the family traditions the the Stoffel family we mentioned Charles Stoffel Stoffel won the first ever NASCAR race held at Bristol uh that was you know when Cuckoo Vaughn passed away about eight years ago the yeah, I, I talked to Malcolm Brady about him and of course Malcolm and him were friendly rivals yeah. But there, there's so much rivalry on race night. Yet you know they, they're all in the in the in the in the business together. And of course, as you mentioned, the Marlin family has uh, been able to go on through the years to uh, to keep the heritage going through the whole family. And now, and as we speak, I'm sure Sterling is working with his daughter Sol and getting her her ready for her. Her first ever truck race is Saturday night at Speedways, Fairground mm -hmm. Speedway in Nashville. That's right. Where they all got their start after they left Columbia. <laughs> That's right. Of course, those guys would race in Homewood Mall. They'd race in Huntsville, Alabama. And, and it's the, the Cuckoo, uh, I guess the Alabama gang, the Allisons and the uh, Red Farmer, and those, that's, they, they, when Cuckoo come to town, or even Malcolm raised them, and there was always going to be a, that was going to be the big battle when, when the big big race in North Alabama that they'd come down, or if, if the Allison Gang and Red Farmer come to Fairground Speedway to race, and you know there's I guess there's a lot of probably untold stories of the old dirt track racing both in at Duck, Duck River and everywhere else. You know, there's there's quite some, and the Marlins. Uh, as we said, going on to uh, with Sterling, of course, the father Sterling's football career at Spring Hill High School under Coach Brud Spicker. Brud was quite a uh, uh, quite an innovative coach and innovative person, and and uh, he had he had a really good football team with with Sterling quarterback. And Sterling's and was uh, Coach Spicker's son, Spook. Who's gone some coach in his days? Spook was the center. Sterling was quarterback his senior year. They won two bowl games in one year. Is that right? Guys <laughs> so got to play in two. And uh, uh, Matt Donald Oden tied in on that team. Matt Donald uh, played several years in the NFL with Cleveland Browns, playing mostly behind Ozzie Newsom, with, uh, who was a, a Hall of Fame tight end, now a general manager for the Baltimore Ravens. You mentioned Spring Hill, and you're a lifelong Columbia, Maury County resident. How has Columbia changed over the years? What